So we outlined the general ideas in the last video on ethics when we contrasted the Belmont Report and the APA pr ethical principles. Let's continue that today as we're looking at, at research, particularly animal research. So in terms of ethical standards for research, generally we're looking at standard eight. Um, so standard 8.01 suggests that there should be an institutional review board to determine whether research is actually ethical or follows the ethical guidelines. Uh, 802 talks about informed consent, which is something that you're, if you take any other psychology class, you're going to hear that uh, repeatedly. Uh, 807 is looking at deception. Um, and certainly there was some deception in Milgram's research, uh, in the Tuskegee syphilis research. Um, and problems with debriefing from standard 808, you know, telling people what, what actually we expected and what we found. Um, there were problems in, in, um, the, uh, in the Tuskegee research. In terms of research misconduct, we're not supposed to fabricate uh, data, which sounds like a no brainer. And yet every once in a while, there you know, is a published report about this. And also we should not be plagiarizing or self-plagiarizing, standard 8.11. Self-plagiarism refers to copying yourself from another paper. Yeah, which is something that sometimes people do when they have a series of research articles on the same thing. And then animal or animal research is described in standard 8.09. So in terms of animal research, we are setting up some protection for laboratory animals. And you know, this is a an expanding kind of issue that generally species that we like, such as dogs and primates, have had more rights for longer periods of time than things like mice or species like mice and rats. The animal care guidelines, as outlined in Standard 8.09, focus on three R's. Replacement, so rather than using rats, uh, you might use a simulation of a rat. Um, refinement, you know, so changing how we're approaching the, the use of that work. And reduction, including reducing the number of, of animal participants that we're using. So using the least that we can for the kind of research that we're doing. Uh, this is a, you know, as we're talking throughout here, we're talking about a balance because on the one hand, what we know about um, all sorts of things that keeps us safe and promotes our health has depended on the use of animals. On the other hand, um, there are concerns about the animals' rights, and obviously they are not, you know, not consenting to be part of this research. So I, I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is when do we want to use humans? When do we want to use animals? When do we want to use simulations and why?
So let's talk about a, a study that was proposed um, and funded by the Nas National Institute of Health. Um, in the study, they compared the current rules, which limited uh, first year residents to working no more than 16 hours without a break with a more flexible schedule that could allow young doctors to work up to 80 or up to 30 hours. And the researchers would examine whether more mistakes happened on one schedule than, you know, than the other and whether residents learn more one way or the other. And let me just be clear, residents are refers to doctors in training. So they've already gotten their license and they're or they're they've passed through medical school and they're doing their postgraduate training. So do we have real informed consent? That's certainly one question we'd want to ask here. Could physicians, could the residents refuse to participate? participate. Were patients informed? Could they refuse to participate? Could they say, eh, you know, I'm not sure that I want to test this new, new strategy. Um, so we're looking at what schedule promotes learning, what, what or where do we have the fewest mistakes? And what Stein concluded was patients were not being informed at all. So we're completely unwitting subjects of this research. The residents are aware that they're in this trial. The residents, the medical or the, the doctors are, resident, are aware that they're in the trial but have no choice to participate unless they want to leave the residency in training program. The programs argue the studies put patients in, and, um, and residents at risk. Sleep deprived residents are more likely to injure themselves while doing procedures such as drawing blood, inserting IV lines or suturing wounds. And the accidents could lead to infections with viruses such as hepatitis and HIV. Tired residents tend to get into more car accidents after work. So should we be doing this research? And, you know, should we be doing this with people who really cannot consent to doing that or to being involved in the research? And, you know, what both the APA ethics guidelines and Belmont would say is that you better, you better have a lot of benefit from doing this and relatively low risk. You know, what kinds of safeguards are you putting into place here? Okay. And this finishes chapter four. Um, as always, make sure that you are going through and checking out uh, these. Uh, terms from the chapter and your understanding of them, make sure that you're also going through and doing some of the extra examples that are in the PowerPoint. And take care.